Good evening. Before I start my talk today, I'd like all of you to read this quote behind us. It's a quote by Will Durant, an American philosopher. I want you to keep it in mind as I speak today. A few months ago, I went to the top of a hill in Tallahassee. It was a warm and humid night in rural Florida, it's swarming with bugs. But I wanted to experience one of the most enriching activities out there, stargazing. I was with Dr. Harrison Prosper. He is a renowned physicist who has worked at CERN and Fermilab, and he was pointing at the stars with a laser, much like my own. It was interesting and captivating seeing all the constellations, but what really interested me was this small red dot in the sky, our future home, Mars. You've probably heard in the past few years of uh, these companies like SpaceX, Boeing, and Virgin Galactic all stating that they will be the first to send a manned mission to Mars in the 2040s, 2030s, and for the most optimistic, the 2020s. But then what? What's in the long term? And also, how will we get there? How will we survive there? And most importantly, how will we thrive there? Well, to answer the question of how we'll get there, we can put people on a ship and put them across the ocean. Wait, sorry. I mean, put people on a spaceship and put them across the vast expanse of space for months at a time. Wait a minute. Doesn't that sound familiar? It should, because as I'm going to talk to you today, our future colonization of Mars will have many parallels to our past colonization of the Americas. And as we look at these parallels, we can apply the lessons from the past ingeniously to our future. So first, these American colonists would cram into tiny ships for months at a time, usually one to six months, in tall, small, tiny spaces. They would run out of food as they crossed the Atlantic, often contracting scurvy from malnutrition, and they would gain many psychological problems due to being crammed in a small area for that long. This leads us to our first lesson to learn from the past, ensuring the physical and mental health of the passengers as they travel. Spaceships like these these spaceships must, must provide for more than the colonial ships did before. Colonial ships provided water and food, but our future spaceships will have to provide much more. They have to provide air and atmosphere that, for the colonists to breathe. They have to provide electricity and, most importantly, recreational space. These amenities are a major selling point for selling space travel and making it safe and comfortable for people to travel between planets from Earth to Mars and vice versa which will help create and start the colonial process. <clears throat> to start, these American colonists would cross across the ocean, and it would be very hard. But it was very difficult to understand how those parallels would happen with our future colonization of the Americas. Um, as you can see, these um, Martians would have to adapt to the new environment in new ways. Uh, the, the Martian colonists would have to be attracted to go to Mars. They need a motivation to get there. Right now, we can't just ask someone to go, oh, hey, go to the Mars, go to Mars and live there for the rest of your life. We need a motivation. Back then in the colonial era, the uh, colonists would go to America for a multitude of reasons. They would go because of persecution back home a famine back home, or even the gold rushes back in America. We don't have those, um, those motivations as much today, but we can still motivate them using another lesson from the past, which is, as I'll explain to you, European monarchs would uh, uh, advertise the new world by giving land grants and colonial charters to those nobles who are willing to cross the Atlantic Ocean and colonize the new world. Why can't we in the future our future governments, why can't they give these land charters where land is the most abundant resource on Mars and give it to people who are daring to cross interplanetary space and colonize the new planet? This will be the perfect incentive for people to cross across the vast reaches of space and create the population necessary for a sustainable colony. Let's assume that the travel across interplanetary space went well and the, the descent into the Mars' atmosphere wasn't too rough. Now the colonists are on Mars. How will they survive in such a foreign environment? The colonists of Jamestown faced a very similar question. Unfortunately for them, 
in the new American land, they were inexperienced and they didn't know how to survive and grow food and live off the land. Sadly, by the next winter, only half of them survived. We can learn from their mistakes by sending more experienced scientists. Sure, Mars is a very dry, barren desert and has barely an atmosphere. And an average human who was left to be exposed to the elements on Mars would only survive one and a half minutes before they suffocate in the carbon dioxide atmosphere and freeze to death in the negative 40 degree climate. However, by sending colonists who are scientists who understand the soil, the atmosphere, and the resources available on Mars, we have a much higher chance of creating a sustainable and successful colony. It's amazing how with our modern technology and the resources on Mars, we can actually create habitats. For example, the resources such like water under the polar ice caps, or nutrients to grow food found in the soil, and even the construction materials can be found in the sand. All we need is human ingenuity and motivation and the second home for humans is within the realm of possibility. So now the colonists are able to survive. How will their lifestyles change? How will they be different from those on Earth? The American colonies were effectively independent and separate from Britain due to the vast expanse of the, American, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. This led to the formation of new cultures and new traditions. A similar situation will happen due to the lack of communication between Earth and Mars. But wait, you might ask. Couldn't we just text or call? It's hard to think in our interconnected world, but it's not so, because messages can only travel so fast. For an example, if I was on Earth and my friend was on Mars, and I sent him a message, it would take 22 minutes for the message to reach him. And if you were to send me a message back, it would take 22 minutes for the message to reach back. This 44 minute wait time is too long to have instant uh, real-time calls and real-time connections. Only made worse by the fact that the sun will be in between the sun, the sun will be in between Earth and Mars for a period of, periods of time, rendering all communication impossible. This is both a blessing and a curse, since there will be a lack of communication, but on the other hand, there will be the development of new Martian culture. There will be changes in language, changes in institutions, and community, and technology. Language will change by how the colonists will begin to talk to each other, adapt each other's mannerisms, uh, start speaking like each other, and adapting how they talk in patterns. This will lead to the formation of new dialects and new accents, much like how the American colonists began to speak what we know now as American English, and also began to lose their British accents. Technology will begin to change as the colonists begin to adapt to their new environment. The Martian environment is much different than Earth's. The Martian day is 24 hours and 37 minutes, and the Martian year is 687 days. This will warrant the use of new calendars, new watches, new Mars clocks, and much more. New technology will also include the technology used to create sustainable habitats, such as things such as air filtration system, means to produce energy, etc. These will be need, need to be innovated to help the Martian colonists survive. These are only a fraction of the new technology that will be created for these Martians. The people are now safe and sound in their habitats. How do they organize themselves in society? Well, uh, how do they organize themselves in society? There's no better way to organize them than through government. A great political innovation of the past few centuries was the, the creation of democracy in the American colonies. The American colonies were independent, effectively independent due to the lack of British control. And they began to experiment with the new radical ideas of democracy and republicanism and incorporate them to the new forms of government. Who knows, maybe in the future, these Martian colonists will experiment with new ways of governing themselves, more efficient than the ones we have today. And finally, communi community will begin to change. For example, these Martian colonists will have to talk to each other more, and their ties to each other will be stronger than any ties that they have with people on Earth. Only made stronger by the fact that new colonists will be born on Mars, colonists who've only seen Mars and consider Mars to be their home. The formation of a new Martian identity will happen. This leads us to our last lesson, learning to let go. The British failed to understand this when they tried to re-exert the control in the American colonies time and time again. 
causing the American Revolution. Let's hope this time around we can learn from their mistakes and not have an interplanetary revolutionary war in our hands. So now we have a very thriving Martian colony that will no doubt evolve, innovate, and change the way we live our lives. But I want to bring us back. Why space? Why now? And why us? It's hard to imagine, but each and every one of you is in mortal danger for each and every second of the day. All it takes is one well-placed asteroid, or a trigger for nuclear war, or even the slow but growing threat of extreme climate change, and humanity can go extinct. As a great physicist and, Michio, and futurist Michio Kaku once said, we cannot keep all of our eggs in the same basket. By expanding our presence to Mars, we'll actually be setting up an insurance plan in case something bad goes, goes on back on Earth we can actually have a second chance on Mars. By spreading to other planets, we'll actually be able to ensure the survival of humanity for millennia to come. To think that all of this came from looking at a small, tiny dot in the sky. To be honest, from crossing the frontier of the oceans centuries ago, to crossing, crossing the final frontier of space in the next few decades, it's amazing to see how History repeats itself. However, it's up to us to learn from the past and grow so that we can be the master of the earth that holds us and be ready to leave it. Thank you.